Oh, it's Wednesday, November 28th. That's wonderful. And we are, it's a long awaited day of doing really advanced stuff wi- uh, inter- as interacting with internet servers. Uh, so we began the semester pretty early working with the web query, saying, hey, we just want to go get data from web server, bring it in, and, and do some stuff with it in Excel. There's two major limitations for working with the web query wizard. Number one, everything's got to be publicly accessible. So you've got to have a URL that you can go straight to. And number two, if there's something that you need to kind of plug in and hit enter, even if it's publicly accessible, the web query wizard is not going to do it. Now, if when you, when you type something in and, and, and submit a form, an HTML form, if where it takes you, you could copy that URL and paste that somewhere else, and it would go to the same page, that would be OK. Um, that means that we're using the get protocol to make the request. But if we're using the post protocol, which is really common, you don't get a URL that you could just plop in somewhere else. And so this ability um, to, to be able to log in to get data is a big one. Uh, did I say that was the second thing? The second thing is that you are limited to be able to see just what is visible on the page. And there's lots of information that might be interesting that comes back from the web server that's not visible on the page. It's maybe the information is embedded in a link somewhere. Uh, it doesn't show, but what you need is, is written in a, in, a, in a hypertext link. And so those two things are going to take us, uh, those two limitations of the, of the, visual, of the uh, web query wizard are going to take us down this road, which is remote controlling Internet Explorer from, uh, from VBA. So we have a module here that I export. .bas file is what happens when you export a module. So we're going to download that. And then we're going to go ahead and open up. Looks like I've already downloaded it. We'll go ahead and, and open up a brand new workbook in Excel, and we'll import that module, and that'll give us a place to start. So in this module is just a set of tools that I have built over the years that makes working with Internet Explorer a lot easier than kind of working from scratch. Incidentally, this is also one of the places that there's a lot of bad information online about how to do this. Um, so if you just think, oh, you know what, I'll just go you know, Google about how to do this, you'll end up getting a lot of bad information, as opposed to being in class today where you'll get all the best information available on the Internet. Actually, most of this is not on the Internet. So Alt F11. Here's how we import a module, which we've never done before. Choose File, Import, File, and then go find that file that you downloaded, which should be in Downloads and Mod IE Tools. Dot bass or base. And we'll go ahead and insert a module for us to work with. All right, so our environment now is set up, and you may still be setting that up. That's fine. It'll take a minute before we get to it. Let's also now look at, hmm, we have a link to go to here, but why don't we start, why don't we start at LDS.org? I'm going to come here to LDS.org, and I'm going to want to look at my directory. There's a lot of stuff I can get to here that is not password protected. Now, my, war, my account and uh, directory. As soon as I say I want to go to my ward's directory, it's going to say, slow down there. You're going to have to log in. <sighs> so, might be interesting to be able to get to, the dire- to your directory. This is just an example of a web page that I think most of you probably have an account if you don't have an LDS.org account, that's okay. You can still see that the example we're doing today is working because what we're going to do is we are going to automatically have Internet Explorer plug in a username, a password, and click the sign in button. If you have an account, it'll sign you in if you put the credentials right. If you don't, it will say, sorry, I can't sign you in. But that's the point. It will actually do that. You will, you will send that information to the server and it will respond appropriately based on what you put in. So that's where we are headed. So back to our code. Okay, so step one is we are going to want to make, uh, we'll need a reference. So we're going to be sure to add a reference to some kind of Internet Explorer object. I can't remember what it's called. Let's go take a look. So tools, references, 
And it'll definitely start with Microsoft, so we'll come down here to the M's. Oh, I got an M way up high. Like Micronaut, Microsoft. Hmm, I might have to look it up, I don't remember. Maybe Internet Controls. Microsoft. Hmm, Microsoft Internet Controls looks, looks tempting. Let's try it. We'll know if we had it right because when we make a sub procedure, sub log in LDS. When we come here and say dim IE as Internet Explorer, if that shows up as a choice, we've got the right one. Uh, Microsoft Internet Controls. My C R O S O F T. Set IE equal to a new Internet Explorer object. That first line, all it does is declare, it's, just a, it's, just a, de it's a definition, declaration of an object variable. It allocates enough memory to hold a reference to some other place in memory. So we're actually going to create an Internet Explorer object right here as new Internet Explorer. So here we're going to bind that on. Of course, we could use the keyword here as a new Internet Explorer object, and then that declaration statement would also create an instance of the Internet Explorer object and bind it onto the variable. But we're going to want to leave this separate for something that we'll see later today, so we're doing it in two steps. Uh, IE dot navigate. Actually, a navigate and a navigate to. Um, I'm not sure the difference is, except Navigate 2 sounds like it must be newer, so I'm going to use it. And then I'm just going to put in the URL that I'm going to try to send the browser to. HTTPS ident.lds.org, single sign-on, user interface login, whew, it's all there. Now, here's one of the things that's a little bit interesting when we first started this, and that is... This browser is not visible by default. That's good, because it may very well be that you say, I want to do something with Internet Explorer um, in the background. I don't want my user to realize that I'm using Internet Explorer because I'm kind of embarrassed to be using Internet Explorer. Hey, what are my other options? What are other browsers that I could be using? It turns out I can use any browser that exposes its core functionality to the component object model, so sometimes abbreviated COM. That's, that's, the, that's the object model that I have to use to be able to use it from VBA. I'm going to list them off. Are you ready? Internet Explorer. That's it. Internet Explorer. <laughs> now, there are a couple other projects um, out there that uh, essentially say, well, you know, Firefox exposes its core functionality, but not to, the, not to the component object model. So there are some other projects out there that are saying, you know what, let's make a wrapper for Firefox that will that will work with Firefox the way it wants to work with and then expose its functionality, but it's separate from the Firefox project. Um, and so that may be something that will end up using, not you in this class, but I may be forced to do it because it, it seems like Microsoft it, that has no plans to expose Edge's core functionality to the component object model. So, uh, and they have stopped development on Internet Explorer. It is the cleanest way to do it for now, um, and it's still working pretty well. Uh, but no telling, um, you know, how many years you'll get out of this. You probably at least still several years. Okay, and so, but the point is, it's invisible. So I'm going to say IE dot visible equals true, because I would like to see it. And this is going to do something that's a little bit unusual, and so I'm going to put a breakpoint before we navigate. Okay. So, I've, I've, uh, so number one, I've added a reference to the Microsoft Internet Controls. I've declared a variable. This is just enough memory to hold another location in memory. I'll bind that variable onto a newly created instance of Internet Explorer. I will make it visible, and then before I navigate, I'm hitting this breakpoint. Let's go ahead and run it. 
So I haven't started to navigate yet, but we can see that it has started up Internet Explorer and it's, it's, it's made it visible. Now, normally when you open up Internet Explorer, there is some default home page that, that you go to. You know, it says, listen, when you open up Internet Explorer, you want to go somewhere, and so we'll take you to your home page, however that's configured. But when we open up Internet Explorer through the component object model, when we just programmatically open it up, it, it says, we don't have any reason to believe that you want to go anywhere because there probably isn't anyone looking at it anyway. And so it does not navigate you to the default page. So you kind of look at Internet Explorer here. It looks some way that you've never seen it before. It's just sitting there, not showing anything. That's just, this is different. So now I am going to um, navigate, just execute this line. Um, F8, shift F8, F8, where's F8? And so we can make it navigate now to that page. So now we've got the page loaded. All right. So first thing, uh, after we say navigate, is that, so here's something that's a little bit unusual to us. Normally, everything we do in VBA, we say do this line, and it takes, you know, it might take a few seconds to do something, and if it does, it's going to wait until that statement's done. And that's exactly what it does here. It waits until the statement is done. All the statement, all this, all this statement does is it says tell Internet Explorer to navigate to this URL. And once it's told it to navigate to it, it's done, and it moves on. It, and here's the important part. It will move on before the page has arrived. So we have to do something to say, listen, you know, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find the place to put in the username. And uh, if, if, if the username's not there yet, it won't be able to find it. So i got to tell it, wait. Wait until this is done. And this is one of the things that most of the examples you find online are okay, but they will not serve you well on some more complex sites. So let's just take a look over here at Mod IE Tools. And this top procedure that I've given you here is called wait for, and you pass it a reference to an Internet Explorer object. So we've got a couple of do loops. So we, we enter a do loop, and we enter another do loop, and then I say, wait for, can you guess what this says? We've never seen this line of code before, but what does this say? It's actually wait for one second. So, we're, we're, so application.wait, we're going to wait until what? Well, whatever time is now. In fact, you wait until a specified time. What's the time? Now plus one second. Now, hmm. I kind of wish I didn't have to uh, talk about this line right here. <sighs> Sometimes, um, Internet Explorer, it has a security setting. We could go change the security setting so this wouldn't be an issue, but the last thing you want to do is remember that wherever this workbook goes, you've got to go change the security settings on Internet Explorer for it to work. Sometimes, when you navigate to a different page, Internet Explorer opens up a different instance of Internet Explorer. It, it's actually using a separate instance of Internet Explorer that's showing in the same window. And so you have essentially lost connection to the Internet Explorer you were working with. And so what attach IE is defined down here, lower, attach IE just connects to the most recently opened Internet Explorer uh, window, should be window. And so it, it's going to it's, it's just going to say, wow, has a new one been opened? And if it has been, attach onto that one. If it hasn't, a new one hasn't been opened, it's going to attach onto the most recently opened one, which presumably is the one that we're currently working with. And so it's going to say, listen, if we're, if we're navigating, we might need to attach onto the, the newly opened window, even though you don't see it as a different window. Um, and then we do events in case the operating system is trying to do anything. And then we, we loop until two things happen. So IE has a Boolean value called busy. True or false? So if it's in the process of doing something, it's busy. And it has a ready state that can be 1, 2, 3, or 4, maybe 0 as well. 4 means I'm done doing stuff. A lot of times you will see this kind of loop built that only looks till IE busy is done or until the ready state is 4. There are times when 1 will be it won't be busy, but it hasn't reached its final ready state. Um, and what can happen is that like, once it's received all the information from the web server, 
it will, it'll be done, but then it'll realize, oh my gosh, you sent me some active script and I've got to rebuild this page. And so it may not really be done. And that process may actually be bringing more components from online. And so we're going to, not only are we going to loop until we find out that we're both no longer busy and the ready state is four, we're going to wait another second. So that will let us outside of this loop. We'll wait another second. And if we are still not busy and the ready state is four, then that'll let us out. So it does this. So, so when you call this, it's going to take a minimum of two seconds because it's going to wait for a second. It's going to check where we are. And, and if it's where we want to be, if it looks like we're done. It'll wait for another second, check again, and then let us out. Question, yeah. That's not the document's ready state. Yeah, this is the, this is the Internet Explorer's ready state. We'll be dealing with the document here uh, later on today. Okay, so that was, um, that was a little trip through wait for. So because we've got that module imported here, we can come right here and say wait for IE. So the Internet Explorer object that we just navigated on, we're passing that over to the wait for method. And so the wait for method is going to say, oh, that's the Internet Explorer that we're waiting on. That's the one to look at to see if it's in the proper ready state. All right, so I'm going to take, let's see, I'm going to navigate somewhere else here. I guess I'll just go to Google. Um, and let's just watch how this works. I guess I'm going to put a stop in here. And we're going to see it navigate. But I want you to watch what happens. Do we hit the wait? Do we actually, yeah, I'll just do it with, yeah, I'll just do it with F8. Do I get, do I get to the wait line before the page loads? And you'll see, absolutely. We're at that, you know, even though this page loads pretty quick, you can see that you get to the wait line before um, you get there. And then wait will now take two seconds. I'll go ahead and run from here to check to make sure that we're in the right ready state, and then it will move on. So the process so far, create an instance of the object, make it visible if you want to. I mean, after this is done, we can turn that, you know, get rid of that visible line, and it will, this will all happen without ever showing the browser. Navigate to it, wait for it. Now we've got the page that we're going to try to manipulate. So here, we've got to figure out how are we going to get to this. We've we got to get right here and type in, you know, it turns out my username is gov. That's one of the nice things about having an unusual name. You can often get it as a, a nice username. So I've got, got to type that in. I want that to go in automatically. So we have to find out how this object is identified. So I'm going to inspect this. I'm going to right click and I'm going to say inspect element. And this will bring up a little object inspector that will show me that the HTML that generates that particular, hmm, let me zoom in here, that particular tag. So this is an input tag. It has a name, ID token one, it has an ID, also ID token one. If I see, if I look at this tag and I say, wow, it's got a name or an ID, I go, whew, it just got easier to find this tag. If it doesn't have a name or ID, we can still get at it, but it's more work. And if it has an ID, that's fabulous because the ID is supposed to be unique. There should be no two tags on this page with the same ID. Now, it's possible that some bad HTML person could have said, yeah, we're going to have two tags with the same ID, and that will still work, but it's against the rules. And so if we see ID, we go, great. We can just go straight to that thing. So now that I know that the, the ID is called ID token one, we should be able to use that to identify that particular, that particular element. So after I've waited there, so, so I've waited for IE to finish loading, and now I'm going to say IE, IE dot document. So it is, you know, I've got the browser, which is my IE object, and that has a particular document that's currently being rendered. And all the tags are all part of the document. The document collection, or the document object, has a collection called all. It is a collection of every tag. It's a collection, so it's a, it's a list of things. And so every tag that's in the page is a different entry in this list. So in fact, let's just do this. 
let me just, I'm going to see how long document.all is. Right, how do we, so it's a collection, how do we ask for how many elements are in the collection? Yeah, if, it, if this thing were written in VBA, you know, it would follow the VBA standards, it would be count, but it's not. You know, it, thank goodness, I mean, Internet Explorer is slow enough as it is, if it was written in VBA, it'd be terrible, well, more terrible. So, uh, it's actually length. So it's just a different convention. But that should still tell us uh, how many elements are in the length. So this page only has 115 tags. Is that a lot or a few? That's really a few for an HTML page. Um, because it's not just what you see here, it's also tags that are invisible. They're just controlling the structure of the page. So that's great. Now, document.all, so I could actually, I could, I could look at one of those. Um, I can look at the 55th one. And let me ask for the outer HTML. So I'll ask for the outer HTML of the 50. I have no idea what the 55th tag is. We're about to find out. There it is. It's a line item. Apparently, it's somewhere that you can choose language. Is a place? Oh, yeah. You can choose language right here. And apparently, one of those is Norsk. Do we see it there? Yeah, there it is. And so the, that happens to be the 55th tag that generates that little part of the page. Okay? Now, that's because collections, you can go after them by their ordinal position. Um, but I don't want to go by its ordinal position. What, do you th what else do you think I could put in here? Yeah, the name or the ID. And so I'm going to put in here the ID. I forgot what it was. It was ID token 1. Is that what it was? ID token 1. And I'll ask for the outer HTML of that one. Now, if I've done that right, it should give me back an input tag, and it should be just that one we looked at. There it is. Input, it's an input tag. The name is ID token one. It's got a tab index of one. So when we hit tab, that's the first place we'll go. Uh, and there's other information. Wonderful. And so I can just say that's going to be a reference to that object. So that's the object that I'm after. Now, it's an object in the same sense that we think of objects in VBA. And so it has methods and properties. If you're going to guess at the property we had to change to change what's showing there, what do you think it would be? Take a guess. I think I heard value. Someone say value? That's it. Value equals, and I'm going to put in my username. I'm going to go back and just run that line. And we can see that it has put in that username right there. Hmm. It must have been so small that you didn't see it happen. There's usually a little more of a gasp when that happens, you know, because it's an amazing thing. You know, when we've actually made Excel to control that. <gasps> oh. Okay. Uh, so, kind of same thing now for password. Uh, I'm going to look and see what it's called. Inspect element. It is ID token 2. <laughs> oh, I guess that makes sense. These are the ID, this is the identification tokens, 1 and 2. So ID token 2 is not my real password. And so now I'll run that line and it should, you should see it put that password in. So you know, of course, I'm not putting my real password here because I don't want you guys finding out, you know, all the people in my ward and calling them to sell them, uh, what's the kind of things we sell these days? Some essential oils or something, you know. <coughs> you know so sell your own ward members those essential oils. Of course, when you go there, of course, it says not to be used for commercial use and so forth. Okay. So, uh, that's not my real, but, but you can see it, put it in there. Okay. Now, this next part, we've got a couple of options. So, kind of the, the, the default way, the, the normal way for working with a form is that I've got, on this HTML page, I've got a form tag. And that form tag contains all this information that I'm going to try to bundle up and send off to the server. And so, all I have to do is submit the form. That's the, the default approach is I've got this form, submit the form. Um, and, and that's often an easy way to do it. However, sometimes, what 
a web page does, you know, in today's much more sophisticated web than, you know, what I learned with back in the late 90s, is instead of submitting the form, what will happen when you click that OK button, it'll say, ah, we're going to go run some JavaScript that collects all this information on the form. That form doesn't know anything about where to send the information. But we'll have some other program that runs in the browser go collect that information off the form and send it somewhere else. In that case, you might not have the luxury of just saying submit the form. You might have to say find that button and click on it just as if a user was clicking on it. So those are the two things that we're going to see how to do to submit this form. And let's just go ahead and take a look. So I'm going to see if I can figure out, I'm going to first see if I can find the form itself. So I'm going inspect to inspect one of these elements, and I'm going to kind of look up in this hierarchy until I find a form. So here's, here's the form. So the form is oh, good. It has a name. That's good. So it has a, it's called login, and it has an action. Typically, when the form has an action, that's, that's where it's going to try to send the information. If it has an action, you can typically submit it. So we just have to refer to this. We can identify it by its name. So oh, what was it called? What was it called? Was it called login? Now, we're not going to change a value. Oh, I still have it open. We're not going to change a value of it. The form is called login, yeah. We're not changing the value, which is what we've done before. We've got to tell it this form to send the information along. So it's going to be a method. I'm going to call a method of this object. Any guesses on what that object might be named? Or that method might be named? Send, submit, would be good choices. Turns out submit's the right one. And again, once, once I tell this thing, once VBA says submit that form, it's done. It has sent the submit method to that object. It's not going to wait until the next page has come. And so anytime I do something to cause that page to navigate, I'm going to want to say, now let's go ahead and wait for it. All right, so I've got the information set in. Let's just go, go ahead and see if that submits. We'll bring this back to here and run it. Yeah. So now it is submitted. Username or password is not recognized. Please try again. For additional help, please visit our help page. So that's one, is to, to find the form and submit it. Second approach is to find the button and click on it. So let's give that a shot. So let me inspect this element. Uh, I must have already had that open. Inspect element. Eh, well, I doesn't like that. So we'll inspect this one. That'll be close. Then we'll see if we can find that button. Content two. Better zoom in. I can't even see it. All right, so I'm trying to find, so here's a, here's a div, a division of the page that might have the button in it. Let's see if I can find it here. There's some invisible stuff. Content 2. Some legal notice, field sets. I guess I'm going to try to see if I can search for the text. So what's on that page? What's on the button? Sign in. So I'm just going to see if I can search for that text in here. It's a problem being zoomed out. Thank you for that tip. So Control F. Does that bring up a search window somewhere? Oh, there it is. Sign in. Yeah, so here it's found it. Yeah, so it's in a div called submit button. And I was just a little bit lower. I just I gave up a little too soon. I would have found it if I kept going. So it has a name, login.submit. Does it have an ID? Yeah, login submit button. So that will get me a reference to that particular one. We'll get to that. The question is, how do we do it if it doesn't have an ID? And we're going we're gonna to deal with some tags today that don't have IDs and still get at them. 
So login dash submit dash button. Login dash submit dash button. Now, we're not submitting it. That's what we do to a form. What do you think it is going to be? What are we trying to do to it? We're trying to click it. Now, because I'm looking at this page, it reset my username and password. I'm going to drag my current position indicator back up to where it's setting the username and password. So we can see those go back in again. And I'm going to clear this off so that hopefully it will bring it back when I submit and fail my login again. Yeah, so it's still submitted, but this time it did it by clicking rather than by just sending the information from the form. Question? You say click, and it says the method's not supported by the object. Are you click? Are you? You didn't have a computer. What is it, you did it on paper, and that's what it said. Ah. So if it's a button object, it submits. It supports the click event, but it may not have. It may not actually have the uh, an event handler put onto it. But I don't think it would give that error. So we we'll have to take. We we'll have to take a look. Um, yeah, so the, is, was it a button object? Hmm, I'm not sure. Just can't get to them. Interesting. There's a comment here. Is there a su suggestion? So yeah, that's a possibility. So, so yeah, how do you handle this? And the answer is, um, I, I might be able to help you through this, but not without really seeing the code. So, so, you, so, so I think you're better off saying, hey, let's make sure the page is loaded. Um, and you might actually, you, you could make a loop, a different kind of loop. This loop, this wait for load is really general. It just says, hey, wait till this is loaded. But if you know something specific about what has to be there, you could actually do a loop until that is there. You can say, hey, I'm expecting this to show up. Let's, let's loop until it's there. And then once it's there, you can say, OK, now I'm ready to go through and process it. You can, look at the, you can look at the source that's arrived and see what's there. OK, this is our first example. Um, and we're done with the first example. How many of you successfully logged into your LDS.org account? Oh, about half of you. Very good. Question here? So the question is, when you try to launch it, you get an error that says you can't, you can't launch it because it might have outdated. Uh, and is that when you're just trying to la launch the browser or when you're trying to go to a page? Oh, just going there. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Can't connect securely to the page. So yeah, probably Google the error and see what it is. So browser's coming up okay, but won't, we won't let you get to that particular page. Go ahead. Um, when I load the page and log in, I web page the header and everything. Okay, so yeah. Well, one th yeah. So one thing is when you go to this particular site with Internet Explorer, it says. Oh, you know what? We don't support this browser anymore. So get a newer browser. But once you're logged in, see, once, you're log once, you, once you log in here and wait for it to load, the next step could be to send it to a different part of the page. It you don't have to necessarily click on that page. Right? So you could have another link that you could go to only when you're logged in, and now you can navigate to that. So you could have another navigate to and push it to a different location. OK, question here.
it, so the question is, if your desired web page just says, hey, you're using Internet Explorer, I'm not going to show you anything, which it could do, then you're just out of luck with how I'm showing you here. If that's the case, then you want to look into another project called Selenium. So Selenium is, uh, there's a nice VBA wrapper for the whole Selenium library, which, which lets you automate Chrome. Um, we're not using that here yet because IE is still working and everything is, is kind of here. And Selenium is, it's got some quirks of its own. But, when, but I've run into things I can't do with IE and I use Selenium for that. Um, if, if you want to be in VBA, that's probably the next, the next place to go. If you're not opposed to losing another language, I would recommend Python as a great language for doing this. The same kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, a far better language for doing this kind of stuff than what we're doing here. But the whole point is here, you might have something you're doing in VBA, you just need to get some data from the web, and this will do the trick. I have a former student who um, you know, kind of saw this in, in class, and he's built a whole company doing something with, with uh, like, it's like um, l rental listings. And, oh, I think it's like, like ma managing your image. So if you're a rental company and you've got people saying bad things about your rental, you want to know what it is. So he's got a company that will kind of help you manage that. And, and so he's spending a lot of time pulling data off of various websites, doing it all with VBA. And occasionally, you know, he'll call me, oh, Professor Allen, I just can't figure this part out. Could you help me? And I'll look at it. And sometimes I can help and sometimes I can't. But usually that conversation ends with, you should be doing this in Python. You know, this is, what you're doing here is all this, learn Python because you're going to be a lot happier there. Um, but if you're saying, I just got to pull in some information from this process that makes sense to be here in Excel, then that's the place to be. So that kind of disclaimer here, this is, not, this is not the right place to be doing, to be building a company that looks at internet data and, and brings it in. Ah, so, okay, so let's, let's take a look at that question. That question was, you know, we might get some kind of undesired uh, behavior if we've already got an Explorer window open and we just try to attach on to another one um, or, or we try to open another one. The truth is I've seen this. I'm not quite sure exactly why it's happening, but I know how to get around it. Um, and so that's going to get us to that uh, attach IE. So we're going to use that attach IE all by itself. We'll come back to mod tools, and attach IE, you'll notice, returns a Boolean function. It returns a Boolean value. So if I say I want to attach onto an Internet Explorer object, if it's successful, it'll return true. I found an Internet Explorer object and I've attached onto it. If it can't find it, it'll return false. And so we can use that information here to say, before we bind it on, let's say this. Let's say if attach IE, if attach, is it called attach? Yeah, just attach IE, like this. Then, actually, if not, so if attach IE returns false, then we want to bind IE onto a new instance. And so I'll just bring that up here onto the same line. So a single line if statement. So if I can't attach to an IE, then I want to set my IE variable equal to a new instance, attached onto a new one. Uh, and then either way, we'll make it visible. So now if I stop this and run it again, it should successfully attach. So I'm going to go ahead and step through it. F8. Oops. Control, Shift F8. That wasn't very impressive. Let's do it again. Shift F8. So it, it, it successfully attached, so it returned true. So not true is false, so we didn't come over here. But if my Internet Explorer window was closed, and I run this, Shift F8, It wasn't able to attach, and so now it will create a new instance and then make it visible. And it will try to log in. <coughs> okay, other questions? All 
Okay, let's do a, let's do a different example. So, um, the whole point is I want to actually be able to log in somewhere and then get some data. Now, that would require that you have an account. I used to do this with uh, a site called Naxos.com, which was, and still is actually, the purveyor of CDs, of classical CDs. You want to buy a CD, classical CD, that's the place that has them all. Classical music CD. I don't know how they're going to keep surviving because people aren't using CDs nearly so much anymore. Um, but um, I felt guilty for abusing their site with, you know, this is not such a big class, about 80 students, but, you know, I have classes with 150 students, so. Uh, so instead, we're going to go to a site that I built, and we host on um, Blogger, I think. But if we come back to Learning Suite, oh, my page has expired. Oh, link is still there. So, colonialbakehouse.com slash Chicago slash inspection. So, what we have here is um, information from the city of Chicago about inspections of food establishments. So, it seems like I pulled the data in about halfway through 2016, so you won't find anything more recent than that here. Uh, but you can say, hmm, I'm interested in looking up a particular restaurant, or I just want to see inspections that have failed, and the failure reason contains, hmm, oh, droppings. Uh, and then here's this, this default range just in the month of January. And so here's the results, big and littles. New Orleans Street, Chicago. What does it say? Found evidence of mouse droppings. Approximately 40 mice droppings. The inspectors are counting. One mouse dropping, two mouse dropping, three mouse dropping. Inspection was on the 11th of, of January 2016. It was, it was a failure. And then here's kind of the rest of the information from that, from that particular inspection. So this is just information the city of Chicago makes public. So I downloaded it one day and pushed it to this site that you could abuse without me feeling guilty like we're abusing someone else's site. I figure Google can take the abuse. So, um, uh, interestingly, it's kind of one, as soon as Chicago, what, what might you do with this kind of data? What, you know, if you had access to this data and you had a way to, to, to fetch it kind of automatically, periodically, and look for particular things, what could you do with this? How could you make money with this? There may be lots of ways. There was kind of one innovative way that I heard about when I was studying this data set actually dealt with this particular failure, mouse droppings. What kind of company would you have to have before to, to, to have that, this inspection be a really interesting inspection to you? Yeah, pest control. If you owned a pest control business and you could find out the moment that Chicago updated the data to find out who failed their inspections today, would that be valuable information? Yeah. Because this manager has just failed a rodent control inspection, and does he have to get it fixed quickly? Yeah. Is he going to be closed while, it's, while, he's got, while he's failed? No. They're going to say, listen, you've got some problems here. If it's severe enough, we'll close you. But 40 rat droppings, nah. We're not going to close you for that. But you've got to get it taken care of. And so here's the situation in Chicago. So we're going we're to come back in a week, have it fixed. You come back in a week, it's not fixed. He's got to pay like a $250 fine per day that, you know, it wasn't fixed, and then they'll probably close him. Is he motivated to hire someone to fix his rat problem? Yeah, and if you call him, hey, we've got a special on rat problems. It's double our normal price, but we won't tell you that. What do you say? Yeah, come on out, fix my rat problem. So that's just kind of a, an example. And in fact, we now have, um, there are lots of municipalities that publish all kinds of data. They figure this is government data. It's there for the people. It's open. and it's just out there. So, um, um, so here we go. This is the one that we're after. So we've got a URL. What was the URL for this one? Let's go ahead and get the, I'm going to go ahead and copy this example because this example is pretty close to what we need. Okay. 
This one, I'll just call it uh, Chicago Inspection. Give me an explorer, attach if we can, otherwise make a new one, make it visible. Ah, now we're going to navigate to the main page. You can get that off of Learning Suite, or it's not too bad to type. You should be able to see it here a lot better once I get it put into the code. Colonialbakehouse.com slash Chicago slash inspection. Seems like I signed up for some kind of web service somewhere. I said, you got to have some URL. What do you want the URL to be? And I didn't know what to put, so I made a Colonial Bakehouse. Never use it for anything. If anyone wants to start a Colonial Era Bakery, talk to me because I got the URL for you. <coughs> yeah, actually, we didn't call bakeries bakeries in the 18th century. We called them bake houses. So we're going to wait there. Okay, so now let me go ahead and run up to this point. And we should be able to, I think we probably have similar tokens. Let's go ahead and see if I can find. I'm going to go ahead and say I want to put in for, I want to be able to you know, search for, there we go. Violation contains. Let me inspect this, and let's see if we can get attached to it. Oh, by the way, another way that I could look at this source is to come here and I press Control U and view the source of the page. That's a, that, don't do that. That's a dangerous thing to do. Well, it's not dangerous. It'll just take you down the wrong road. If I view the source, what you see is not what's currently rendered on the page. What you see is what HTML came from the server when I said, give me this page. So I say, give me this page. The, the web server sends some information, and that's what, you, that's what you get when you say view source. If there's active content on that and it rearranges itself once it gets here, you don't see that in view source. You do see that when you inspect the element. And so you, you, you definitely want to say, I'm going to look at this page by inspecting it. OK, so it has an ID called violation text. Violation underscore text. Uh. I'm never quite sure if it's case sensitive or not, so I just match the case. And why don't we put crab in here? Let's see who's talking about crabs. Apparently. If you're serving crabs, they have to be tagged. You can't just go to the river, catch your own crabs, and serve them. They've got to go through some licensed crab purveyor. Um, and then, I guess that's enough for right now. We don't care if they failed or not. We just got to get to result list. So let's see if we can find how to submit the form. We'll look at this button, inspect element. Kind of the same thing. Am I not really getting it? Right click. Oh, I clicked on it. Should still be able to get to it. Ah. Come on, you browser. Right click, inspect element. So what is it with buttons? I can't inspect them here. It has a name, and the name is Submit. Oh, it has an ID. The ID is Search, like that. Okay, so let's just see if we can do this. So I'm going to F8 through this. Oh, we don't need to put in my password here. It won't find. This would cause an error because it's saying, look at this document, find the ID called ID Token 2, and then refer to it. Is there any token with that name? There's not. And so that would have an undefined object that we're trying to call a method on or a, a property on. So we'll execute this one. We'll wait for it to load. And we now should have information about crabs. Let's see if we can find crab on this page. Uh, let's see, this is a failed inspection. Facilities do not maintain proper temperature. 
observe the four-door prep cooler with an air temperature of 49 degrees. What's the highest that should be? Anyone from the food industry? 40 is the maximum that you should have, yeah. Used to store potentially hazardous foods such as hamburgers, sour cream, crab cakes. Oh, boy. Okay, so there we go. So now that we've got the, got the information, now our next step is to actually pull that information off of the page. Uh, and so uh, that's going to be next. You know, I wonder if I put that tool. There's a tool that I wrote. I'm just not sure it made it into this module. Let's see if we have something called import page. Oh, we do. Let's look at import page. I'm not quite sure what import page is going to do here. So let me explain what import page does. So we're familiar with the web query wizard, right? The web query wizard is a pretty good job if you can go directly to the page. Well, here's a page we can't go directly to. Um, let's see. Or uh, I'm not quite sure. Are we actually changing what's up here? Mm, submit. Yeah, actually we are. We could go directly to this one. But if it's one that we couldn't go directly to, um, we wouldn't be able to use the Web Query Wizard to pull the information in. But this import page, what this does is it saves this as a local file. Um, you've seen us working with files before. You'll notice here we're opening this file for output. Yesterday, or last time we were together, we opened files for input, reading data in from the file. We're going to push data out to the file. It's going to put it as a local file. Where is it going to put it? Wherever this workbook is. Well, that's a file called local web page agent file.html. That's so hopefully I'm not accidentally writing over some other file name that you have there. If you have a file named that there, it will delete it. Uh, and then it's just going to invoke the web query wizard functionality to look at that page. So you've logged in, you've navigated to the page that you want, and now you can just say, hey, import page, and this procedure will say, take what's on that page, write it to a local file, point the web query wizard at it, and pull it in. I think you have to tell it the name of a page to put it onto. Yeah, new sheet name is going to create a new sheet, and you can tell it the Internet Explorer, and it'll just pull in the information from the active sheet. Uh, you can tell it to go into a different workbook if you want, but we'll just accept the, the uh, default workbook. So I'm going to come back to my code, and let's just import that so we can see what it does. So we've waited for the page. I'm going to say import page, i.e., and I'm going to give it a new sheet name, data. It will create a new sheet, and it will import it with that. And so we'll see how it brings this data in. Oh. Ah, I don't think I've saved this file yet, and so it doesn't have a path. So let me go ahead and save this workbook. Yeah, it's just book one, so let's save it. Because until you save it, the path comes back as blank. So let's put it in my downloads. We'll call it uh, IE winter, uh, no, fall of 18. And nope, let's make it a macro enabled workbook. All right, now that I've saved that, I should be able to just continue playing from where it had the error. And we'll see it create a sheet called data, and it brought all the data from that page in here. So sometimes that's a beautiful thing to do, especially if the data is in an HTML table, because that's one of the things the Web Query Wizard is really good at, looking at an HTML table and bring it into a nice table in Excel. This data is not especially good to work with, but we might be able to do what we need to with this. So if what I'm trying to do, let's say that my next step is to get the names of the companies that had failures. Um, where, who is it here? So I've got business type. Oh, that's, that's probably my search form. What is the name of this? I'm going to have to go back to look at the web page to see. So, oh no, business license. Oh no, this is it. This is, Chicago. it's called, yeah, it's called Chicago Q. So it's right here. So let's see what the next one is. Look for China City. So here's China City. So how am I gonna how am I gonna know if I'm gonna now kind of looking over the data on this page, how am I gonna be able to to to, to figure out the names? That's why I just want to see the names. I want to see the names of the people who failed where crab is a text in the in the, the response text is in the Yeah? Ah, 
Ah, so we can find business license comes up, and is it always one, two, three, four above it? Yeah. If there's an address, there is, but there might not be an address. And so, I, I, so, so the answer is, I probably could make this work. And that might be tempting to do. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there's an interesting thing, is that that HTML page has a lot more structure to it than just the data. We've taken the data off that page and dumped into Excel just to show the data, but the HTML page itself has a lot more structure to it. Let's take a look at the page. There was a comment here in the back. Yeah, let's take a look. So, so interesting thing is when we look at the name, it's rendered in a different text. So there's some kind of tag around this that tells us to make it look like the name. And if we can use that to help us get to the name, it's going to be a lot more reliable. So let's go ahead and just see how, uh, how they did that. So I'm just going to come here to China City and I'll inspect this one. Inspect element. Oh, it looks like it's just in a level three header. So if we were to find the CSS sheet, then it looks like they've just defined all level three headers to look that particular way. So that's the way they're doing it. Um, that's really not that great of news. It'd be better if there was a class that said like, you know, restaurant name. This is the restaurant name class, and that's a kind of a common thing. But as long as they don't use the H3 tag for anything else, this actually will be pretty easy to work with. So let's, and that's the tag we're after. There's no ID. If there was an ID, well, I'm not sure that would be helpful because the ID would have to be different for each one. So this won't be too bad, though. We can, just, we can go for this. It turns out, um, let's go ahead and just search for FH3 and see what else it's used for. So Chicago Q, China City, Chinese Kitchen. Uh, I'm not sure what it found it else. China City. Oh, there's only three. So it looks like that's all it's being used for. Okay, so how could we use that information to go and get that data? So there's import page. That's kind of fine. I'll leave that there. Let me put a note on this. This uses the web query wizard, wizard to bring in the data. So web query wizard. But that's not necessary for what we're about to do. So we have a collection of all the tags. Any thoughts? In the back? Oh, we could just kind of pull in the collection of all the tags, all the H3 tags, and make a collection just of those. That would be really nice. There's not. So there are some predefined collections. And so there is, there is one of all the links. Do we have links on this page? Is there any hypertext link on this? There may not be. Um, but there is a collection that's called links. And it is a collection of all the links. There is one called forms. It's a collection of all the forms. So there are some that are predefined. Uh, H3 is not one of them. So the only collection we've got is all. That's the one that we're going to have to work with. So what we could do is we could just write a loop that looks through them all. And we could say, well, let's look at this tag. Every tag has a tag name property. Is this an H3 tag? If it is, it's one we have to look at. Um, and so fortunately, I have written that loop for you. Let's just go take a quick look at it, and it'll be really easy to use. So we should have another method in here called get tag number. So it actually is a little more sophisticated because you pass into it a tag to start with if you want to. So it has an optional tag to start at. And if you don't supply it, it starts at zero. So it starts at the first tag. And so we're going to say start at the very first tag, look at all the tags. We're going to see if the tag name matches. And then if the tag name matches, we're going to look to see if some identifying text that you have passed in is somewhere in the outer HTML of that text. So we're only going to look at it if it's an H3 tag, and there may be something else that we need to look at in there. Now, in this case, it's only the H3 tag, so we won't need to give it that identifying text, but that's there as well. 
And that's what this does. It just sets up a loop. It, let's see if we can see it. Start at the tag number and go to document.all.length. Ooh, why minus one? Zero based. Yeah, so the first one is zero. So the length is actually one higher than you need to go. If the tag name, if the uppercase of the tag name is the uppercase of the tag name that got passed in, we got the right kind of tag. Check to see if the identifying text that was passed in is in that tag's outer HTML. If so, return the tag number. We're using X to keep track of where we're looking, and then get out of the function. So that loop's already built for us. We just have to use it. It's called get tag number. Hmm. Maybe I'll go ahead and, and declare a tag number here. Dim tag no as a long integer. Tag no equals get tag number. I pass it, I, an Internet Explorer object, the tag name, h3, the identifying text we don't need, and we don't need the, so we don't need anything else there, at least to get started. I'll execute that line. And let's see what my tag number is. That tag is number 176. So it found one at 176. Let me ask for the tag number again. But this time, I'm going to tell it to look after 176. So start with 177, and that should find the next one. Five. And so the next one is at 256. That's what tag it is that we're looking for. So we've got tag number figured out. Hmm. Let's do one more. Actually, we'll do two more. So 266. That should find our third one. And if I'm correct, we only have the three. So let's look at 347, or starting with 347. And we should now not find it again. <coughs> the question is, what is tag number going to be? What it could, what's it going to do? It could throw an error. Um, doesn't throw an error. That's good. Ah. So if it doesn't find it, it says that's tag number negative 1. Can I have a tag number negative 1 in a collection? Nope. Starts at 0. So that's how it communicates back I was unable to find it. So let's make a loop that uses get tag number just to get the tag numbers. And then once we have the tag numbers, we'll pull out the data. So how, what, what kind of loop should we do? For loop, do loop, probably do loop. Do until tag no is equal to negative 1. And loop. We'll put a debug.print of tag number in here. And we're going to tell it to start at tag number plus one. Now, the little problem here, but I think you'll agree it's not a, it's, it really is a little problem. So tag number is declared as an, an integer variable. What's its default value going to be? Zero. So I'm telling it to begin looking at tag number one. Start with tag number one. I'm going to miss the very first tag. Is it possible that that very first tag is one I'm interested in? No, because the very first tag is going to be like the HTML tag that has the whole thing in it. So there's going to be a lot. Of the, the heading tag is up there. The body tag, there's a lot of tags before I get to the content in there. If I was really concerned about that, I would just initialize tag number to be negative 1 to start, and then we start at 0. But it is not going to be that first one, so I'll leave it just the way it is. So that should print my tag numbers off. Hmm, but I am going to need to initialize tag number because tag number already has a value here. So tag no equals negative 1. Oh, wait a minute. Do until tag number equals negative 1, so we'll start it off at 0. And that has printed off our tag numbers. That's great. 
So now we just got to pull those values off. We're just after the names. Question here. Ah, so the question is, if we had, a, a, if there was some kind of element that was, that had an ID that was above it, could we get the one that has the ID and then offset to it? The answer is yes. Now, what we've seen so far is we could just offset by counting. If we get the tag number of that parent element, we could say, oh, we need that tag number plus one would be the tag number that we're interested in. Uh, but there's a whole different uh, object set that we can use that um, actually is the, the document object that would allow us to say, get the tag, get the next child. There's all kinds of methods for working around those. We haven't brought that in yet, but that's available for manipulating this document. So we could, we could get that, we could pull it into that object, and there's lots of methods that we could use there. But even what we've learned here, just far, if, it's, if you know it's the, like the third tag from the one you've got, you can find that one and then offset to it. Okay. Uh, now, instead of printing the name, I want to print the element. Well, that's pretty easy. So that's going to be IE dot document dot all, and I'm going to put in the tag number. That's going to get me a reference to that tag. Now, if I pull the outer HTML, it's going to pull the, 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 the tags that are define that particular that doesn't quite sound right. The tag that define the tags. Anyway, it's the, that, the, the tags that define that element. But fortunately, there's one called inner HTML, which is just what's inside those, those beginning and ending tags. And this is going to be OK until I get to this negative one. So let's do this. Instead of looping until, let's come right after we set the tag number. And let's say if tag number equals negative one, then exit do. So that's, we're going to start this do loop. We're going to try to get that tag. If we couldn't find that tag, just get me out of here. That means there are no more tags to find. We'll print the tag number. And then we'll print the inner HTML. So this should print out those same numbers. And then it should print the names of them as well. And I'm in break mode somewhere. Oh, up here. Up here at the top of the loop. Execute that. And now it's found the data that we're after. From here, it's just a matter of saying, that probably isn't all the data we're after. I don't know what else there is on this. but. We could go and, and get that other data. So this is um, you know, kind of the, be the beginning steps into this. We've got one more day on this, but this is you know, a pretty powerful thing. Folks, we don't have time to talk about it today. We'll make sure we spend time on Monday. But um, I I'm really not worried about anything else we've taught you in this class until today, um, to where I've now given you the ability to break the law pretty easily. Anytime you start automatically interacting with someone else's server, there are rules to follow, and some of those rules are legal rules. So d this weekend, don't go crazy thinking, woohoo, I'm going to write a program to go uh, copy eBay, which I tried to do once. That it was in the late 90s, so it wasn't as big. I may, tell you some about the, I may even tell you some of the war stories and how I found out exactly what these rules are. <laughs> Uh, they involve the FBI. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's leave that good there for now and, and pick up next week. One more question. Oh, so we put a do events and that's always good. So it turns out I wrote loops for decades before I even knew what do events was, so that doesn't come natural to me. That was a lot of, you know, whoops, that was an endless loop. I need to, you know, recover that work. That's a good idea. All right, we'll call it good there.